Morphological processes. In this video, I'm going to go through some of the most common morphological processes that we see cross-linguistically, and I'm going to illustrate each one using some examples from English. So to start with, one of the most common ways of changing words morphologically is to use affixes. Affixation involves suffixes, prefixes, and infixes. And there's a stem or a root to which they attach. So for example, you take the verb in the English govern and you add that er to it to get governor. Or you take a word like louse, that nasty insect, and then you add that d to it, making d louse. Or we can even do an infix in English, although it's rare, and we can get fan bloody tastic. Now, infixation is more productive in other languages, but it does exist to a small degree in English. Compounding is another common way of creating new words using morphology. And in this case, what we do is we take two free morphemes. And remember, free morphemes are those morphemes that can stand alone. Unlike an affix that's a parasite, it needs to attach to a root. But a free morpheme can stand alone. You take two free morphemes, squish them together, and you create a compound word. And I want you to remember, spelling is irrelevant to the study of language. So it doesn't matter that, for example, hot chocolate is spilled with a space between hot and chocolate. It's still a compound word. And we can see that in two ways. First of all, the pronunciation of it. We don't pronounce it in the same way that we would if we just wanted to talk about chocolate that is hot, in which case it would be hot chocolate. Whereas when we talk about the actual drink, it becomes hot chocolate. And there's a difference in the stress, right? So in one case, it's chocolate that is hot, hot chocolate, in which case both nouns get some heavy stress on them. Whereas when we've got the single noun hot chocolate, the only heavy stress falls on that first syllable of chocolate. All right, similarly, we've got whiteboard, which is different from a board that is white, which is a white board, whiteboard and white board. And likewise with noun phrase, noun phrase, noun phrase, not noun phrase. Okay, now, another difference that we should note with compound words is that the meaning is somewhat arbitrary. You can't predict the meaning of it simply by knowing the meaning of the two parts. So we talked about hot chocolate, the drink. In that case, you cannot guess what hot chocolate would be simply by knowing what hot means and chocolate means. Now, it's reasonable that that drink is called hot chocolate, but it's not necessary, right? So anything, you know, for example, a chocolate fondue is hot chocolate, but it's not hot chocolate. <laughs> I should also note that um, Dairy Queen used to sell frozen hot chocolate, which would seem to be, uh, on its surface, it would seem to be contradictory. But of course it's not, because all of us can imagine how you get frozen hot chocolate. All you gotta do is take the drink hot chocolate and cool it far enough that it becomes frozen and you've got frozen hot chocolate. Our next process is called reduplication, which is not a very common process in English, certainly not a productive one. Um, probably the most common one is this kind of odd one where, where we want to belittle something. If you want to dismiss the notion of money, you would say money shmoney. That's about the most productive process of reduplication that we've got in English. It's much more common in other languages. And in fact, when we look cross-linguistically, it's a fairly common way of creating plurals is to reduplicate part of the word. Alternation is where rather than having an affix added to a root, we change some sound within the root. So for example, we begin with the word foot in English, and when we want to make it plural, we change the vowel to feet. And similarly, when we want to make the past tense of swim, we change the vowel and it becomes swam. And we see a, a, an even 
broader alternation in bring versus brought. I think you can see intuitively that there is a relationship in that they both start with that same consonant cluster, br. But there is a pretty big difference in the final part of each of those words, ing versus ought. We would still call that an alternation. An even further process, though, would be suppletion, where there's no relation between the two, uh, no phonemic, I should say, relation between them. Um, so, for example, good and better. There's no sound change alternation going on there. It, these are just completely different sound uh, sequences. But we get a sense intuitively against that these are the same words, different forms of the same word. And, and I think with the different inflections of B, you see the same thing, where B becomes an, are, is, was, were. And likewise with the present and past tense of go versus went. Same word, just different tenses of the same word, but they're clearly not phonologically or phonemically related.